Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the campfire with uh, Skopje, Lisbon and uh, Bologna, where we will discuss live with uh, our invited speakers from the three cities. For those who are just uh, joining us, uh, this morning we learn more about some uh, iconic actions that uh, each of uh, these cities has uh, implemented during uh, the rock project. They were the need of Piazza Alcini for the city of uh, Bologna, the interpretative center of uh, Marvilla in the city of Lisbon, and the light festival uh, in the city of Skopje. As you can see, they were very different typologies of actions, all sharing the use of the same rock circular methodology of research action research. Now we have the chance to understand more deeply uh, those actions, directly asking questions to our invited speakers. For asking questions, please, uh, you can directly type uh, them into the chat or uh, the specific Q&A panel, and we will collect them. You have also the possibility to vote and like the different questions that were already asked. Fortunately, we already have collected the first a bunch of questions, so I will uh, directly start uh, by inviting all the speakers to share the screen with me so that we can start this uh, campfire. Francesco Volta from the city of Bologna. Francesco works for the Department of uh, Culture and the Promotion of the City in the Municipality of Bologna as uh, responsible of the public uh, art uh, office with a focus uh, also on the coordination of uh, civic uh, cultural system and uh, events production. Welcome Francesco. Alexandra Nival from the city of uh, Lisbon. Alexandra is uh, currently coordinating the Marvilla and Beato Interpretive uh, Center which uh, is being created uh, through a rock project in a deprived multicultural neighborhood in Lisbon using a participatory methodology applied to uh, um, memory and to tangible and intangible cultural heritage. Welcome, Alexandra. And uh, Tony Masewski, uh, is, uh, he is a business professional advisor in a uh, developing organization. He uh, currently advises the mayor of the city of Skopje for uh, strategy and development and uh, uh, runs several key development uh, projects uh, with a uh, key focus uh, on the digital city uh, project. And welcome, Tony, too. Thank you all again for being uh, here. And let's start with the first question. The first question that I would like to ask is linked with the use of public space. And I will direct this question to Tony from the city of Skopje. So Tony, how the artistic intervention with the light was able uh, to promote and enhance the use of uh, public spaces. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity for me to um, explain a bit more details about our activity, the Scopia Light Art District Festival. Uh, as I mentioned in my previous um, presentation, uh, the Scopia Light Art District as an event brought uh, actually a new light on the cultural heritage, on the architectural heritage, but uh, also on the public spaces. Um, one of the facts is that most of the installations were actually installed on the public space. 
And throughout the activity and discovering the opportunities um, for the installations, we actually rediscovered some of the abandoned public spaces that we can uh, reuse. Uh, that afterwards gave us a new idea, and that was uh, after the first edition in 2018, um, there was um, an initiative from the, our partner in the project, the Faculty of Architecture, the University of San Cyril and Metilius, uh, that um, a study um, group made a research on the reuse of the public spaces in the um, rock project demonstration area. And uh, that um, study resulted uh, with an exhibition of the findings and uh, the new ideas for reuse of the public space that afterwards uh, were placed as an exhibition in the Skopje Urban Living Lab offices and that um, uh, offices were afterwards uh, used to invite the local stakeholders uh, on the events, so-called um, open days, in which we discussed the new ideas coming bottom up for the reuse of public space. So to wrap, to wrap up, my comment is that the Light Festival literally gave a new light of reuse of the public space itself. Thank you very much, Tony. And uh, one of the core elements that um, is appearing also in uh, New Green Deal uh, calls is uh, the role of citizens uh, as uh, necessary active actors. So I ask this question to Alexandra from the city of Lisbon. And uh, Alexandra, what means engaging citizens in uh, real uh, environments uh, in the case of rock, especially around tangible, tangible and uh, intangible cultural heritage? Yes. Sorry, okay. as, as you, you have seen in my presentation, um, the Marvilla and Beato Interpretive Center is based on a, um, the, a participative um, approach. Uh, so uh, it was essential from the beginning that the citizens and the, the residents and the local institutions of Marvilla and Beato were with us from the beginning of the project. This is very important. We, we have not uh, called them to, to, to uh, join the project when it was already in course. No, they were with us conceiving the project. This is the, 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 the real uh, difference um, because this is the real participation because a, a, a participation process um, has several um, uh, premises and uh, uh, and uh, one of them is is that uh, it it is not the, the, the residents and the the, the, the people um, are not only um, in the middle of the processes but from the beginning because the processes are as as ours as theirs. Um, so I, I can. Uh, um, um, describe some correct, very quickly some characteristics of a, a participatory, a real participatory uh, process. It is, uh, it has to be unfinished and consistently updated, since it reflects a flexible and ever-changing community. The team of experts and the communities must have equal decision-making power regarding methodology, principles, and objectives at every stage of the inventory process. This is not an easy thing to do, but it is possible with, with the uh, persistence. And we must acknowledge the existence of multiple and valid types of knowledge, not exclusively the scientific one. This is the concept of an ecology of knowledge, as mentioned by the Portuguese sociologist Boaventura de Souza Santos the idea that we can um, we must be um, we, we have to acknowledge other kinds of knowledge other than the scientific one 
And we must be able to recognize that all new findings gained from this process are the result of co-production and co-authorship. It's our work. It's not only the municipality work. It's the work of the community. Thank you very much, Alessandra, for your really interesting answer. I um, would like to remember to the participants that they can write questions uh, during the entire panel. We have already collected a lot of them, so uh, let's go on with a question for the city of Bologna. Francesco, I have an, a question for you. You just showed us uh, two pilot actions in uh, Bologna for uh, an adaptive uh, reuse of public space. The first is the project uh, Malerbe in Piazza Scaravilli, and the second one is uh, uh, the temporary green space in uh, Piazza Rossini. Both uh, the experiences start from a parking lot in order to become, as you can, as you said before, uh, spaces for human and urban relations. Francesco, do you think that uh, such kind of temporary projects could be replicated even in other parts of the city, especially in the historical center? Do you think uh, is it important to replicate these kind of actions? Okay, I can... Go on, and then we can return to Francesco. Okay, um, I have another question. Um, as uh, um, Rock demonstrated uh, through the role model and uh, replicator approach, uh, there are lots of features to be learned from other cities, especially when dealing with the social uh, innovations and uh, innovative ways to deal with uh, urban spaces. Okay. Um, a similar question can be interesting also in the case of uh, uh, the city of Skopje. Tony, what uh, are the main elements of the action that you presented today in the session before that can be replicable in other European cities? And how do you think this approach can be done? Actually, Daniela, I, I got two questions um, now. So I, I would start with the second one. Um, the Rock Project actually created uh, a perfect knowledge and experience exchange platform among the partners in the project. So I see this model of multilateral and bilateral cooperation among the, the partners and the cities as a pr good practice and a practice that uh, I would recommend. The way we learned uh, things about um, the light festival as such, the way the city of Lyon transferred the knowledge to us I would definitely recommend, and this is the mentoring uh, approach. We had a good mentor and we, we could, uh, as I already mentioned, we could learn only from the best. So maybe again, uh, at this occasion, I would like to pay tribute to the recently uh, passed away, Mr. Jean-Francois Zerovic, the uh, director of the Fête de Lumière. Um, when I come to the elements that can be transferred or can be replicated, uh, there is no such thing that you can replicate things, but uh, you you need to actually guide uh, the, the replicator city in transferring the model of the light festival. So we are talking about transferring a know-how on the model. And this is in order to avoid uh, the passing of so-called baby phase uh, by each and every city. Why being alone when you can get a help from outside? And um, I would just uh, comment on on few very uh, important um, elements here, and this is the team formation. Each and every city will need to pass a process of forming a, a team for a light festival. Who do you need on board? It's a very important issue. It's a very key issue. 
Then what we discovered together with Lyon is that the light festival itself has to create its own ecosystem. The ecosystem of the light festival is so special and you need to identify it and you need to map all the stakeholders in the ecosystem that furthermore, they become your partners in the, uh, in the light festival. And because the light festivals are very technologically demanding, you need to pay attention to technology that is needed. And of course, in order to be successful, you need an audience. And for the audience, you need to pass a whole process of promotion and, and marketing approach of a light festival. That is, I can say, very special. Professor Longo, can you hear Thank me you. now? Yes. Thank you, Tony. So we can uh, try again with Francesco. So, Sorry about uh, that. No problem. Uh, so, Francesco, um, uh, you showed us the two uh, pilot actions, so Malerbe and uh, uh, Piazza Rossini. Uh, the question is, do you think that such kind of temporary projects could be replicated in other parts of the city, and especially in the, in the city center, in the historic city center? Thank you for the answer, Professor Longo, and sorry for the technical problem. Um, well, I think that uh, in this uh, peculiar situation of emergency uh, caused by COVID-19 pandemic, as public administrations, we have to understand uh, that we need to find as much as possible flexible and creative solutions in order uh, to, um, to to rethink the public space. In particular, we have a strong necessity of implementing outdoor activities, uh, especially in the historical center, uh, where we face every day, basically, a lack of uh, green, uh, quiet, and a safe place, especially for uh, children and, and families. Uh, unfortunately, we still don't know when it will be possible to organize again uh, huge events uh, with uh, hundred uh, or, or thousand of people. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I think that in this age that we are living now, uh, in these days, the alternative model represented, for example, by uh, the Cultural Summer of Bologna could be um, surely considered as a very good practice to follow. That is to say, many small events uh, um, widespread in the city, uh, such as, for example, lectures, small theater events, uh, workshops, urban walks, uh, all in safe condition. From this point of view, the city of Bologna is strongly engaged on, uh, on discover new, uh, new spaces and new opportunities. And from this point of view, uh, the temporary experiments of Malerbe and Piazza Rossini surely represented a positive way uh, to test uh, reversible uh, solutions. Uh, because, as you understand, we have uh, to face uh, very difficult challenges uh, because of this pandemic. And basically, uh, we have to face uh, this problem day by day. Thank you very much, Francesco, for your answer. Then <clears throat> we have a question from the public to Alexandra. The question is, uh, how did you select the speakers of the Marvilla stories? Alexandra? Sorry, sorry, sorry. It is uh, um, a simple but very interesting question because it's linked to my uh, previous answer it, it is a participatory process so when we we gathered the the, the organizing committee of the the interpretive center um, uh, we have um, joined um, residents local institutions representatives of local institutions of uh, of uh, associations um, the, the the University of Lisbon through ECS, our partner, but the, the people of the organizing committee 
were the people of Marville and Beato mainly. So when we um, we divided the organizing committee in two groups, and each group went to the territory to um, to collect the, the the cultural heritage elements. They also have the task to find those people who know uh, who knew and who know a lot about uh, the the um, Marvilla and Beato history and cultural heritage. So um, they and this went as, as a snowball sampling. Those people knew other people that um, were very, um, um, that know a lot of, about the territory, mainly old people, but not only old people. Uh, people who had uh, very interesting stories linked and very interesting life experiences linked to the territory. So it was also uh, in a participative way that we have found uh, those uh, testimonials, those people who we have interviewed. And we have interviewed them um, in uh, two steps, one exploratory interview and then the, the um, structured interview with um, better technological um, uh, means. And that the, the result is the, the, the 220 uh, small videos with uh, those testimonials. Thank you, Alexandra, for your answer. And uh, fortunately, we have time for more questions. And the following one is uh, for Francesco from Bologna. As we have seen in Bologna, the temporary uh, mid of Piazza Rossini has been also used as a, a public space for hosting a sort of a political uh, performance dedicated to Patrick Zaki. Um, at this regard, uh, from a political point of view, which kind of role uh, could be represented by cultural heritage of our European historical cities? Well, uh, historically, our European city grew up uh, with the idea of square. Let's say around uh, the concept of Greek uh, agora, uh, which is uh, the agora is a social, cultural and political space. From this point of view, the exploitation of the cultural heritage in order to create, as we said before, uh, new spaces of uh, participation and urban relation are, first of all, uh, political actions. And that's why um, the theatrical performance uh, or, uh, dedicated to Patrick Zaki uh, was symbolically so strong because of its realization in a space so peculiar, such as Piazza Rossini, which was a space rediscovered uh, by the common political action of uh, the Bologna City Council and the university together, joined together uh, for a common political action. And always uh, thinking about a partic participatory perspective of the citizens and uh, of the students. So I think uh, that, yes, the, the role, uh, the political role of the cultural heritage in this peculiar moment is something very, very important. Yes, sure. Thank you, Francesco. I have another question uh, from the audience, uh, mm, Tony. Uh, this question is for you. Can you tell more about rock actions at the Old Bazaar? Uh, oh, it's a long question. And uh, if I start answering, I would uh, have to book uh, myself a conference uh, for this. But as the question actually referred to the demonstration area of Rock the Old Bazaar, I will just uh, mention a few of them. Um, 
one of the most significant things that we did is that we actually uh, founded the Skopje Urban Living Lab with, with its seat uh, in the heart of the old bazaar. And the idea was that we uh, give a new uh, fresh momentum to the local stakeholders and a new motive um, how to emphasize the importance of the cultural heritage and the new reuse of the cultural heritage um, in the modern world. Uh, so the um, our urban lab became one of the places where the local stakeholders could address a question, but also propose an answer to a particular question that in that is in regard with the um, old bazaar. Um, the other thing uh, that we um, did is um, we thought about the lost things that the uh, uh, from the cultural perspective side that we have them lost. And one of the uh, things that we lost in, in the past was um, the Jewish quarter. So we made an application of an augmented reality of the Jewish quarter that is rebuilt. So now the citizens throughout this uh, mobile app can see the augmented um, existence of the uh, old Jewish quarter together with uh, one narrative inside. And this is the telling of a story of one family that used to live um, uh, in that um, uh, area of Skopje. Um, the lost ambiences was, uh, were, uh, were not tackled only in the Jewish quarter, but all over the, the old bazaar. So uh, we made another application that was um, a guide uh, a guided tour for the lost ambiences uh, through the whole old bazaar. So we made an augmented reality models of a few lost, very important, significant uh, cultural monuments that are not existing today because of the earthquake in 1963 and some of the devastation uh, in the previous uh, periods. And with this application, um, the citizens, but also tourists, can find information about the significant uh, culture that existed in uh, in that time. Um, then in 2018, we had the uh, Green Hackathon. The Green Hackathon was an activity uh, that initiated uh, new innovative ideas from the social entrepreneurship perspective. And um, it intended to match the old craftsmen's um together with um with the new technologies i told you i can speak a lot about this <laughs> sorry unfortunately we do do not have more time for other questions sorry i really would like to uh, thank you the speakers from cities for this very fruitful discussion I uh, ask to you all to turn off your microphone and video, and uh, I leave the floor to Cristina Garzillo from uh, Italy, who will introduce you a very special closing of this morning. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, please enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you to Danila and the replicator cities, Bologna, Lisbon and Skopje. I think uh, this was a very interesting session and we really learned about their inspiration and transformative stories that have emerged during the course of the project. Of course, not without challenges, but we hope that the cities manage to convince you that uh, collaborative processes can support the regeneration of historic uh, areas. Uh, I would like now to move to a wider perspective and uh, I'm calling on stage uh, Christophe Codin, Senior Project Advisor at the Agency for Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises at the e European Commission and Giulia Facelli, Policy Officer, Director General for Research and Innovation at the European Commission. So, so thanks to both of you for joining us today. Let me 
dive straight in and first turn to uh, Christophe. Um, Christophe has been following the project, of course, he's uh, the project advisor and the work of the cities from the very beginning. And when Pamela and I saw the Horizon call more than four years ago, we thought it was a perfect entry point to explore how recent and fast moving developments in cultural heritage and urban planning would affect and somehow shape the future of European cities. So, Christophe, how would you evaluate the response of ROC to the Horizon 2020 priorities regarding cultural heritage as a catalyst for sustainable growth? Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, uh, colleagues from uh, ROC, for the opportunity for me to say uh, a few words uh, today. Uh, EASME is responsible, as you said, for the implementation of uh, many programs delegated by the Commission. And my unit is uh, especially in charge of implementing the Societal Challenge 5 uh, of Horizon 2020. So, as you said, ROC was evaluated in 2016 in a very competitive process. And the project was awarded a grant of nearly 10 million euros. I attended the kickoff meeting in uh, Bologna in spring 2017, and I have followed the implementation of the project since uh, then on behalf of uh, EASME. I can say that ROC has implemented the action as planned in the grant agreement. Uh, on top of uh, the own intensive work program, uh, we have requested extra effort from the project, uh, especially uh, to take an active part to the European Year of Cultural Heritage in 2018 and as well to animate the community of uh, European innovators in cultural heritage. Now, uh, ROC is coming to, to an end, and it has suffered from the COVID crisis, uh, as many others of our projects, but I think it succeeded in delivering what it had uh, promised. So, and I hope the, the agency, EASME, has provided the necessary support and an understanding in these uh, specific uh, circumstances. I think the conference is a perfect opportunity for the consortium to present the outputs and achievements of the project, and especially uh, what you have been able to change on the ground in the replicator cities of Bologna, Skopje, and Lisbon, and taking into account the experiences of the front runner cities. So in that sense, uh, Christina, I think we have plenty of evidence that the project responded well uh, to the H2020 pr priorities regarding uh, cultural heritage as a catalyst for sustainable growth. Thank you, Christophe. This is reassuring from uh, your side. Um, yeah, I think uh, there are increasing ex expectations from the city side and from the heritage uh, sector because it should be contributing to the contemporary society with well-being, social inclusion, peace, poverty alleviation, sustainable development. And this is what a bit the rock cities tried uh, to balance. Um, how could you think uh, that other cities could benefit from ROC? So I think first of all by attending this uh, final ROC event uh, because you have a possibility to have a full overview of the solutions provided and implemented by the ROC partners and I think it can uh, constitute a great source of inspiration for the cities. I would say as well, uh, the ROC website, for example, is a good uh, source of information. Many uh, information is available there, videos, newsletters, uh, and because uh, as uh, you, you needed to follow the H2020 open access principle, most of the material is accessible, uh, accessible freely, so publication, deliverables, reports, or, or data. I also invite the cities to visit uh, Cordis, which is a platform uh, where you can also find uh, deliverables of ROC and any other project, actually. Um, what I would like to say as well is that in the consortium, uh, you had some important multipliers at the European level, uh, for example, ICLE or Eurocities, and I'm sure that uh, the results of ROC will continue to be integrated uh, in uh, the daily work of uh, these organizations. In case you come from a small city or village, then I would like to advertise uh, uh, another project, which, which is Ruritage. It's a sister H2020 project, and it was selected and supported one year after ROC, but with the same uh, priorities applied in the rural context. Uh, finally, I would like to take the opportunity to mention a couple of uh, information sources for the cities. So besides Cordis, uh, you can have a look at the Horizon 2020 dashboard, 
where you can see the details and the statistics about uh, the project uh, supported under the program. Uh, if you are interested in Societal Challenge 5, then I would recommend to have a look at the uh, EASME uh, Data Hub, where you can have an information about all the projects. You can see a map of all the beneficiaries uh, from the project in case you, you want to identify the specific partners, for example. So many thanks again, Christina and the work colleagues, and I wish you all the best to finalize the project in the next few weeks. I would like to thank as well the participants for, for the attention, and I wish you all a very fruitful meetings and uh, discussions this week. Thank you. Thank you, Christophe. Thank you also for the information that you provided. Uh, and I think indeed that Horizon can be a spin-off for other local initiatives and activities. Um, I would like now to ask uh, Giulia Facelli, uh, policy Officer, the Directorate General for Research and Innovation at the European Commission, to also share our thoughts with us. We have here many city representatives, researchers, cultural actors. Uh, what are actually the new opportunities for the sector provided by, we are very curious, Horizon Europe, the next research and innovation framework program? Thank you, Christina, and thank you for the invitation uh, in this uh, excellent event, I would say. Um, uh, I hope you are having the same fun that I am uh, in exploring the, uh, the solutions that have been presented um, on the platform and uh, having the chance also to interact and um, exchange uh, ideas and uh, practices and possibly future collaboration uh, thanks to this opportunity. Uh, if you look at the future, Horizon Europe, uh, which is uh, actually the next framework program for research and innovation, uh, this will provide a wide array um, for opportunities, of course, for researchers, innovators and actors and cities. The main idea of the upcoming program is to build on the excellence and reputation of Horizon 2020. And I, I think we can proudly say that projects like ROC have contributed to create it. It will be constructed around pillars um, and also include some novelties. Uh, as per the official creation of the EAC, the European Innovation Council, and what we called missions, well, the pillar two um, will resemble uh, a little bit to the to the current uh, organization of, of Horizon 2020. It will include focus on cultural heritage, uh, as well as cities and communities, respectively, in the clusters two and five. There, the collaborative projects like ROC uh, and uh, many others will also be supported um, by European partnerships. And in this sense, there will be uh, particularly two uh, you would, might be interested in exploring, DUT, uh, Driving Urban Transitions, and Built for People, which is focusing more on the built environment, but has also a specific challenge on cultural heritage and the materials and innovations needed for um, the future uh, challenges coming to us. Um, talking about challenges, of course, climate neutrality uh, for the EU as a whole will be one of them. And um, innovators will have to play a key role in this sense. For this reason, the ERC, EIC sorry, plans uh, to support them, uh, particularly through pathfinders and accelerators. So what I really advise is to stay tuned and um, start checking out uh, what has already been disclosed. And uh, in, in due time, you don't have to wait that long anymore. Uh, you will learn more. Thanks, Julia. So I understand that also Horizon Europe will support research and uh, on culture and cultural heritage, uh, falling under var various pillar or clusters, how you were naming them. I understood pillar two, so let's uh, remember this. But in addition to improving uh, protection, enhancement and conservation and more efficient restoration of European cultural heritage, how could actually heritage-led urban regeneration support the green economy. And this is uh, indeed the, the probably one of the questions for the future. Um, it, it's more of a policy question that we are asking ourselves. But since uh, we like to um, to actually uh, do um, uh, research-driven policies uh, using uh, the results that have been gathered, I think this is a, an excellent one to be asking ourselves and also to to ask Rock in his final stages. Um, because cultural heritage is truly recognized today as a, a sustainable strategic resource. 
uh, for our societies, of course, and environment, but also for the economies and the uh, social inclusions uh, and community cohesion. Uh, what we see today is, of course, that the challenges uh, of climate um, change uh, are uh, impacting uh, urban areas uh, in quite a, a relevant way. And what the European Green Deal uh, will look at is ways to transform uh, Europe as a continent into a climate neutral one by 2050. And of course, now a main question comes along. What is the role, contribution and impact of heritage into all of this? Because we know that heritage is very often located within urban areas, but not just. And in a scenario where we aim at climate neutrality and we see the effects uh, of um, a little test of what um, the economies could suffer in case of uh, tragic events like we want the one we see now of the pandemic, well, we, we really have to look at ways of uh, heritage to contribute into that and also be ready of the impact that could suffer. So I will re green recovery will necessarily have to pass by innovating our way to live and in the cities, but also to look at heritage. Um, if we consider that to, we have estimated that an average of 15% of buildings are at least 100 years old, maybe not all of them are heritage, but they're certainly historic. A reflection to really look at the fabric of European cities and where people live and work. And are we ready to look at heritage through this eyes? Um, and how can we innovate the way we manage historic districts and um, in the perspective of a green recovery while preserving their character, uniqueness and the role for the citizens? We, we strongly believe that the, the, the key element here is the citizens themselves because they, uh, they build the city. Uh, by living in it every way, every day. So um, new participatory models like the one that have been already uh, developed and tested by ROC, uh, as well as new governance and um, financing model will have to be uh, actually uh, deployed on the ground. And um, as I was mentioning before, Horizon Europe will include uh, what we call missions. And one of them that was proposed is on climate neutral and smart cities. And this mission will aim at support 100 cities uh, into their transition towards climate neutrality by 2030. And we really know this is a very ambitious um, objective. But the, the, the point I want to flag here is the reflection, the very deep reflection on governance and the citizens' role uh, as a driver for sustainability. And um, if the mission aims at bringing together actors and co-create uh, the city's actions, well, we also know that the city is heritage led, uh, the, sorry, is heritage made. And um, there, I think the role of heritage will really be key. So um, uh, to cut it short, because uh, uh, that was uh, probably a, a very long answer, um, projects like Rock have gathered experience, solution, and the trust of citizens, but is not alone. Many others, as Philly, um, sorry, uh, Christophe was correctly uh, mentioning, are working into parallel but connected fields. Uh, we will have to put this all together, make it work, and have an impact uh, for the life of citizens, because the future will really be uh, uh, interesting and full of uh, opportunities. Thank you, Julia. I think this is a very important and concerning also the other projects. Uh, you may have known that uh, we have built a kind of community of sister projects of uh, rock. And um, also in the model, in the circle that we saw this morning in this morning's video, the environmental sustainability is a golden thread throughout the rock project. So the urban regeneration efforts go hand in hand with the attempt somehow to minimize our impact on the environment and contribute to the resilience of the community to climate change. So at least a start. Uh, I would like to um, really thank uh, Julian and Christophe for their powerful words and for so much engaging into Rock's work. Um, I think it's now time, I'm having a look at the time, to close this morning's discussion and I pass on to Pamela. So thank you again, uh, Christophe and uh, Julia,
for giving us uh, your views on uh, rock and uh, providing uh, such useful hints on uh, the future of Horizon Europe and on how it will further support cultural heritage related uh, projects and in general terms uh, sectors uh, sectors that has been particularly suffering uh, from uh, the actual situation so today uh, we have seen how rock is a concrete example of how the european union can bring uh, tangible benefits uh, to cities uh, which have uh, become during rock uh, living labs uh, where innovative uh, solutions to new challenges like uh, the climate change one have been designed but in a collaborative manner and uh, experimented to make uh, our cities livelier and uh, more cohesive using uh, cultural heritage as a main lever. And uh, tomorrow we'll have uh, a journey to role model cities with uh, the experience narrated by Athens, Liverpool, Cluj d'Apoca, Vilnius and uh, Eindhoven. And uh, we'll listen to incredible uh, stories of uh, uh, regeneration, for example, of uh, uh, deprived neighborhoods through cultural heritage, uh, uh, on how cities uh, have been able to increase uh, citizens' engagement through the use of new technologies like augmented and virtual reality applications, or by using sensors, why not, to track people's movements in the space. But uh, also on uh, the use of uh, something that at the beginning sounded to us a little bit weird, the so-called video neuroanalytics, uh, to monitor people's emotional and affective uh, status and uh, calculate, uh, for example, the happiness index in the city of Vilnius. So doesn't that sound peculiar? But uh, Christina, I'm sure that other participants and attendees here have uh, other stories to share and that uh, we would love uh, to listen to. Yes, um, indeed. In a few minutes, just after a break, it will be possible to meet other conference participants in random virtual one-to-one -one, uh, meetups, so sort of speed datings. The session, as we were referring to this morning, is called Rock and Roll Networking. Have a look. If you go back to the lobby, there is a box at the upper right-hand corner of your screen and click on that box and uh, you might uh, surprise yourself. Have also a look at the rock exhibition. We were saying this morning to uh, discover virtual booths of technological solutions of rock and also of the sister projects of rock. And um, yes, so if you don't have the chance uh, randomly to meet me now at the rock and roll networking, I would say goodbye for today and uh, meet you again tomorrow. Bye.